Welcome to another episode of the History of EPR podcast. My name is Scott Bernard. We have another fun guest guest with an S today. We're going to do a podcast today, and I'll just go over this person's... Uh, actually, I'll just let you know the name. It's Francis McIsaac. I have his family on with us right now. I'm going to bring them on in a minute. We're kind of trying to go through his um, stats real quick. Nothing. We're going to talk about it more during the podcast. Um, he was the third Islander to win 1,000 races, and that was actually during no winter racing at certain points. Um, leading maritime driver in 1978 with 171 wins. Leading dash driver, which I'm going to get into that part later. Uh, he raced in the Ottawa Canal Ice Race Championship in 1979, the first one. Leading driver in Old Home Week, 10 of 11 years, which is incredible. But I'm going to start with bringing everybody on. So first I'm going to bring Kim Collin. This is his daughter. Hey, Kim, how are you? Hi, Scott. Thanks for having us. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks for coming on. So here is Lee McIsaac. Hey, Lee. How are you? I'm very well. Hi, Scott. Thanks for having us on. And thank you very much for all the stuff you provided. So I really appreciate that, Lee. That was a team effort. So. And here is Bev McIsaac and Mrs. Barbara McIsaac, Francis's wife. Hey, Scott. Hi. Hey. So I want to thank everybody. I really do, guys. I really appreciate you coming on. I know it was, uh, it's, you know, it's really big to me. Everyone's going to love it. And I really appreciate you taking out your time or your, your schedule to come on and, uh, and chat up with me. So I'm just going to hop right into it. And I guess I'll ask um, Barbara. Um, well, actually, we'll go. We'll talk about Francis's childhood first. So whoever wants to start, go ahead. Who's got stories about Francis, like where he grew up at, what his childhood was like, and all that? You well, that, you're in Fairview, Ben. That, that's okay, where you're sure. Yeah. Uh, Dad's uh, parents had a farm here in Fairview, PEI. His family had uh, two brothers and two sisters. Dad was in the middle. Uh, his oldest brother, Clifford, was a veterinarian and uh, then also was a member of parliament in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. His next sister, Mary, she moved out west and was a nurse. And there was dad and then his next sister claire and she uh, was a teacher and raised a family here in pei and his younger brother youngest brother raymond uh, moved to uh camrose alberta and worked okay. had a career right there so I, I, and I mean, we have four people on, so if you got five, actually. So if, if I'm cutting anybody off, just tell me to stop talking. <laughs> you guys just go ahead. But the question is, so what does, like, Francis as a kid, like, was he into horses as a child? Did he like that kind of stuff? They, Dad loved animals. Um, yeah. But they had a farm um, and had horses on the farm. So that was his exposure to horses as a child. Mm-hmm. Majority of people had horses at that time. Right? Yeah, and Prince Edward Island was huge for horses. That, I know for he was sure. born in 37, so it had been like in the 40s and 50s. So that was a really big deal in Prince Edward Island then. Um, Mrs. McIsaac, Barbara, question for you. And uh, I told them, can you tell us how you met Francis? Oh, <laughs> it was fitting. I was working at a veterinary office, and, and uh, the, the, the regular veterinarian was sick. So he had to come in to the director of veterinary services for uh, this horse that had uh, a big leg, he said. <laughs> so uh, whenever I asked him his name, I right away said, oh, you're from Rocky Point. So he was quite curious to know how that could, how I would know. And I only knew because I used to hear some of the girls down in Vernon River, where I was from, talking about this Francis McIsaac. Uh -huh. And there was another Francis McIsaac in Vernon River. So oh. I knew that this guy was from Rocky Point. Yeah. So uh, he made it his business and to find out who I was and why <laughs> did I know him. So that was the beginning. Okay. Um, and what year did you guys get married? We got married in uh, 59. Okay. Okay. And all the kids are perfect. So I was curious with this. Who, how does the age range go with the kids? Is it oldest to youngest? So it goes, uh, it's Bev, Kim, and then myself. And oh, so, so you're the baby. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You can't tell? Oh, yeah, yeah I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's great. Um, let's just take a look. So basically, I mean, I heard the story that Francis and Barbara, you can probably tell, he worked in construction before he got into harness racing. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. And he, uh, the boss he had, he persuaded him that he should get some uh, racehorses. Okay. So that's that's how he started then at the track because this man took his horses to the racetrack and and uh, 
work from there. And uh, when I talk to, oh, go ahead, guys. I, I don't mean if anyone wants to add it, I apologize. Yeah. I don't want anybody out. So, so Dan was twenty six when he started racing horses. Yeah, that's like a, that's he has a bit older, I think. I mean, a yeah. lot of guys start in their early twenties. I mean, but I mean, I was like Wally McGinnis was something he caught on right away. And Barbara, you could probably not know this, but from what I heard, like it was instant almost. Like he just had it. Did you agree with that? What was that? Like he kind of just he once he started racing, it was almost like right away he was good at it. At yes, driving I the think horse. He, yeah, yeah. He uh, even before we were ever married, he used to say that he, he loved all the race hours. And uh, I wouldn't make much comment really about that. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, uh, Mom, what was was it, Lauren Kelly? Like what yeah, was Lauren Kelly. There to get, that's his name. Yeah, that he when he first he used to kind of hang out the track some, and then uh, before he started to drive. But this Lauren Kelly was an older man, and he used to help out some of the younger drivers. So uh, some of the young people who were learning, I think. So he gave them a, a horse to to drive and a truck to truck the horse to Panette, which is a country track. Yeah, and uh, and the harness and all. So that was the. Uh, one of the first times he did drive some on the ice in North River. Those okay. times there was ice then, enough ice to drive on, but there wouldn't be now. But uh, the first time I saw him, uh, you know, in a sulky was at this country track in Panette. And uh, Lauren Kelly was really responsible for helping him out there. So then this man at the construction company bought a couple of horses, so went went from there. Awesome, and that would have been, I think, sixty-five. That's when he started. It was nineteen in that range, I think. Yeah, I yeah, yeah, that would be sixty-five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. perfect. Okay. Yeah. Um, so for the kids, or not? The, well, Francis's children, you're not kids anymore. But what was your? Uh, I'll ask everybody, and whoever wants to answer, if you don't want to answer, that's fine. But what was your first memory of, uh, basically, of your father? That's kind of the best way to start, really. And then we'll get into the racing. Yeah, I'll have a go. That, that, that's yeah, kind of a tricky one. Like you never. Well, I don't mean like that, but I mean, just, yeah. I guess maybe like first memory of him racing, that'd be a good one. Like first memory of being around it a little bit. Uh, I think probably more before seeing some of the races would be, be a big deal to get a trip um, like into town or to the track. Mm -hmm. um, Cause you might be there during, you know, the middle of the day um, and just so much going on and constantly people coming and going. And it was just, there was a buzz all around the spot and there was always a story and, and laughs and chaos. And uh, yeah, for me, that'd be some of the early memories. It was, just, it, was a, it was a big deal to get into the barn and see everything that was going on there at the track. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I know that one. Um, Bev or Kim, do you want to add to that? Yeah, Is, I'd yeah. say that uh, at the farm too, there were always, as Lee mentioned, a lot of people coming and going and we as kids would get on that jog cart and uh, <laughs> one of us would be lucky enough to be on the seat and the others were uh, having to haul it along. We had a lot of fun yeah. um, with things like that and so many horses that uh, were coming and going all the time at the farm. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you want to add Bab there? Go ahead. Uh, Jack Crookshanks gave dad a pony mm. for thinking I was a son um, <laughs> and gave dad the pony for his son, but it was, <laughs> yeah, it was a girl. Um, so her name was Sackville Lady. So I remember that pony. Uh, yeah, that's probably one of my earliest memories. Um, so going forward with it, were you guys all fans growing up? Like, I mean, I know from myself, like I, my father did it and I was just like obsessed as a little one. I'd be at this fence freaking out, and people would probably think, "Why is that little kid freaking out in the third race?" Because my father was racist, so I was going ballistic until he was done. Were you, like, who? A better question: Who do you think was like the biggest fan of the three of yous, and who was kind of like, ah, you know, it's kind of not into it? For me, I'd say I, I'd kind of nominate Bev likely as the biggest fan uh, yeah. of the horse races. Um, you know, I. I certainly enjoyed hanging around the barn for sure and, yeah. and jogging horses. Like, uh, yeah. Um, 
and it was great when you were that small because you really didn't have to do all the hard work. You just that, and everyone, every barn likes to have a jogger to sit on. And all. I remember, yeah. like the first horse I ever jogged would have been Robert Frost Day, and I, okay. I think I was eight years old. Nice. Um, and he was so easy to jog. Now to drive him was another story because he'd pull the arms at him and he'd come to the half up twenty five lengths and then he'd stagger home. <laughs> um, but yeah, he was an awful nice horse. Um, but yeah, that's like I say, I'd say uh, race wise, uh, I'd vote uh, probably Bev uh, for the most interest. Yeah, yeah. I'd second that too. Yeah. I'd have to say it would be Bev. Yeah. <laughs> well, Bev, I see you. Like you're always in the pictures with the uh, in the old home week and stuff like that. I think you guys are all in it there. So I know this will do the old home week thing. I'm gonna play a little clip by Don Hubbard. This is a story about your father. And I have, like I said to you, I have all these interviews. I'm gonna upload them all in full. I just took clips because if I put them in full, we'd be here to like 9.30 at night. So we're not going to do them in full. But this is a really, really fun story about your father at EPR in the 70s. Um, I apologize, guys, that the volume's a little bit weird. I didn't really go to edit it. But I'm going to throw it in. There's a little picture of your father I just put the audio to. So here it comes right here. Oh, by the way, everyone's on mute. If you need anything, just like wave to me, and that will give me the cue to stop it. <laughs> so here it is right here. Don Hubbard telling a story about your father from EPR. Uh, we were all standing up on this uh, platform in the paddock along the fence and we were watching a race in a snowstorm and the gates on the the wings on the gate wouldn't close mm -hmm. so uh, about four of us younger people were standing there and France I'm back yeah did you need me I see your hand go up tap it? no no oh. no you're good Oh, it's just, oh no, did you guys, uh, and it's no problems, we can edit it out anyway. Did you guys hear, I know it's really low quality, I apologize, can you hear the volume? It's low, but I can hear it, yeah. Oh, can you hear okay. it, Bev? I hear it. No, I couldn't no. hear it, me neither. Okay, yeah. But um, that's fine. You might need the volume on your own computer up a bit, Bev. Yeah, that could Mine's be it. A, mine is as high as it can go, actually. Okay. Yeah, I know it's kind of like, it's really low, I apologize for that. Um, yeah, okay. I'll play it, and maybe I like I Lee can hear it. I can tell you the story once it's done. I apologize for that. It's just okay. phone interviews can be a little rough with quality, but I'll play it again, and then if and then we Lee will hear it. We can kind of tell, go over the story once it's done. Sure, it seems like one I haven't heard. Screen, so. It says tap for sound, so I don't. Oh yeah, touch tap in. for. Uh, maybe that's why I'm not hearing it. Maybe try that. Yeah, it doesn't hurt to try it. Yeah, okay, it won't do anything. I get yeah. the same message. Okay. Yeah, try that and see if it works, and we'll be. And I'll start it over again. It just starts automatically. So here it is again. Sure. Right, did you guys both hit the button there? I'll let let me know, and then I'll play it. It's all good. Okay, here it comes. Uh, we were all standing up on this uh, platform in the paddock along the fence, and we were watching a race in a snowstorm, and the gates on the the wings on the gate wouldn't close. Mm -hmm. So uh, about four of us younger people were standing there. And Francis was standing beside us, and and the size of Francis, like a gentle giant, really. And he was standing along the fence beside us, and the and the wing came right along the top of the fence, <laughs> and it would have taken us right out if if he hadn't have taken his big arm oh, wow. and just reached out and threw four of us right in the snowbank behind us. And I'll never forget that because it was kind of a traumatic thing. You yeah. know, we were wondering what he was doing, but then we realized what he did and he probably saved our lives that night, you know. Okay, so I don't know who, did anyone hear it? Did you hear it? I think you heard it, Liz. I, I see you laughing. Yeah, I heard, yeah, I'd never heard that story before, actually. Did you, did you guys hear it? couldn't hear it, no. Okay. So I'll tell you the story, and then I'll I'll send it to you guys, so you can like I'll make it, I'll edit it in and stuff. Basically, Don Hubbard's telling a story. It's a snowstorm at EPR, and they're standing by the um, by the paddock, like watch they're on a, like a platform watching the races. So it's her and a few other kids, and your father's sitting next to them, and the wings for the gate won't close because it's a big snowstorm. So it comes around the turn and almost takes them out, and your father threw all three of them. <laughs> Into the snowbank, <laughs> so, so it wouldn't hit them. And it's great when Don tells it. Yeah, it's it's a little low quality it's for sound, but I guess it basically saved their lives. They didn't know what was going on. Like he just, I guess he took his arm and just threw them into the snowbank. <laughs> <laughs> Never heard that story. <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, it's a good one. Yeah, I got a couple real good. That was awesome from Don. I liked that one. And I think and, I gotta, that that yeah. kind of speaks to 
it's amazing even after this many years we yeah. still hear stories we haven't heard before yeah yeah well, there's a lot about your father definitely i've heard a lot for sure that's but i love that story that's fantastic i'm gonna actually take that and put it through like an actual fix and get the audio up get the background noise out of it and stuff like that yeah because we're gonna do that again um let's just go over i'm gonna show a couple pictures real quick and let's kind of do that so uh, i got a ton of them here is francis with joe hennessy oh, yeah yeah uh, what year was that, guys? Was that like early sixties, probably? When I scanned that picture, there was there was nothing on the back of it. I'm not even sure. I, I assume it's New Brunswick uh, or Nova Scotia. Late um, 60s. Yeah, no Francis, year, but... Francis at that time I think was racing some in Halifax. Uh -huh. okay. okay, and that's Joe Hennessy. Yep, definitely. That's a really nice him. picture. Yeah. So All that right. Would be probably six, you know, the early sixties, late sixties. Or late 60s, I should say, yeah. No, that's great. That's and here's one here, big horse from EPR days, another Mecca. I just kept call I kept calling him another Mecca. It's another Mecca. That's, that's got, another Mecca. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that one there is the Montreal Expos Invitational, 1974. And that's a great picture. So I think on the far right, that's Duke Snyder, like the announcer from the Expos. Oh my goodness. Wow. Pretty sure. That, yeah. Like the connections they had in EPR back then is crazy. Yeah. Like that they did. Like the we get into the Bobby Orr pace later. I mean, just the Absolutely. fact that they had them, like unbelievable. Like Doug Caldwell doesn't get enough credit for the stuff that he did. And I guess we get into that later. But your father, like Doug Caldwell, loved your father. Loved him. I mean, obviously because he we talked about your father brought winter racing to this. Well, uh, I knew track. the number to EPR off the top of my head. So of course at that time you didn't have cell phones or anything and the phone yeah. was on the wall. So on Sunday yeah. night, dad would always sit in the chair in the kitchen yeah. and we had a long cord on the phone and I would dial the phone number and take the phone over to him and he'd put his ent the entries in for Wednesday. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, And they had the old hotline. I remember the old hotline they had. I used to always call that all the time. Yeah. Okay, so and, let me those in. just while we're talking about but you reminded me, yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I, I feel like Bev and Kim did it more than I did, probably because I wasn't paying attention to numbers. But they had to be buying and selling horses in New Zealand and Australia, yeah, and punch in a million numbers. I remember he'd be sitting in the chair reading them off to Bev and Kim to dial on the phone. It was good, it was, it was a procedure, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, and that's like he had a lot of horses in New Zealand and Australia too, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah awesome. I don't know who, and Mom may be able to speak to this. Um, like, I remember, I think it was Bob and John McCardle were two names I remember that, that he'd buy horses through or back and forth with. But I don't know if there's anyone else or how that even started. It's, it's just the two McCardle boys. Yeah, the two McCardles, yeah. But there was a few other people on the island, of course, that bought Australian and New Zealand horses. Mm -hmm. uh, Horace Willis and Boyce and Fayo. And I mean, Robert Frost A would have been, I think, Australian. Jenny Charles, um, another Mecca, I guess. Was another Mecca? I don't know. I feel like another Mecca was, but I'm not sure. Like, some of them seem to have the A and the N or the NZ, but not all of them. Mm. Shareholder N. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Mm -hmm. We get into a fun thing about uh, this is actually a fun one right now to jump into for, for everyone and also Barbara, too. Favorite, like, you don't have to name one horse, but your favorite horse that Francis had, and maybe at least favorite horse. And I'm going to guess I know what the least favorite horse is. <laughs> We've had a few conversations with that horse the last couple of days in interviews. So, yeah, whoever wants to start, you can go ahead. Kim, I think I know yours. You tell me what yours is. Um, I guess, are, are you thinking of, like, uh, I'm not sure which one. Stormy you're... Blue. Oh, yes, yes, Stormy Let's Blue. Just, That's right. Oh, I also right. liked the Colombo Sealster. We have Stormy yeah. Blue right there, actually. Oh, there he goes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's a great picture. Yeah, we have that. Colombo Sealster is hiding on me here somewhere. So let's go find a picture of Colombo Sealster. There we are, up in Charlottetown in 79. Oh, yes. Yeah. Kenny Murnion and then Daryl Pierce at the back. Yeah, yeah. I was yeah, Daryl's a great guy. Love my father. I I was telling the story before we went on. Me and him went to dinner at. Uh, he's like, we well, have to go to dinner. Me, him, and Russell went to Montana's, and it was like six thirty. And he was telling me stories. I couldn't hear them because it was loud. <laughs> There's <was> people <laughs> everywhere. It's, it's before they put everything in place, so it's like I heard like vague stories. But yeah, Daryl's a great guy. 
Um, okay, I, I got to stop for this. I had a favorite horse. I, I like them all, I guess. Um, yeah. Now, least favorite, I'm going to guess. No, I'm not going to guess. I can't pronounce it, but it starts with a B. Oh, yeah. Basilius, probably. Basilius. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my. Yeah. For, for me, that was like a. On. Yeah, at the he'd have a wear a muzzle in the stall in St. John because he'd come out yeah. and actually try and grab people. And uh, I'll never forget the morning. So it would have been a Thursday morning. Uh, Dad would have just gotten home from St. John, and I went into their bedroom and looked at Dad. Uh, Basilius had bit him. Oh yeah, right here. Yeah. Um, I thought and, that was Tarborn. Oh, maybe. Yeah, and prob bit probably got bit multiple bit times. Yeah, all the way down. That was it. Mm. Wow. So that horse was basically crazy, pretty much, but the sounds of it, it was insane. Yeah. Like, it yeah, was... Basilius acted up. I remember Dad had uh, um, one of those joggers that you tow behind a truck that you could put, I think, four horses on. Mm -hmm. And that he was in back the field with it, and that horse, Basilius, acted up, and it. Uh, yeah, he had to untangle him from the jogger and get him off, and it come at him. And actually, it, that one bit him on the elbow, I think, and you can see yeah. like the beat mark down there. But I think, yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mom, I thought it was Tarhorn, which would have been Alec and Fee's horse, was acting up on the truck on the way to St. John. And they put down the tailgate, and when they put the tailgate down and lifted like the head up to walk up, Tarhorn was on the back, and I think he hit Dad with the um, front hoof in the face, and then he bit him. I, I, uh. Some that's horse did. I'm not sure if that's the yeah. one or not. That's that's right. That's the one's right. Wow. It, um, so yeah, my father, I don't even know. I he he it was, I think, you know, we could just jump right back in it. Like the 70s in St. John, like that was a luc lucrative, like EPR was a big deal. The amount of money that yeah, thing so brought they, in. They'd bet a hundred thousand dollars on a foggy Wednesday night. Right? Yeah. Exactly. And there'd be nobody there. <laughs> that's what always surprised me like you wouldn't see a big crowd and they'd bet these huge numbers that's... well probably because half my family's no, i'm just kidding <laughs> but there was listen i still go to epr i see guys up there betting like a couple hundred bucks on races like mm -hmm. inner track and stuff these guys they want to make their money but i mean yeah it was uh pretty big so i'm gonna jump in let's see where we at so back to epr we'll just jump right into that because we talked about you know the horse actually because we were clicking in and out there so that horse that your father had that bit him, like, man, that thing was nuts. Like, was there any reason behind it? Did your father figure out what was wrong with this horse or just temperamental? Yeah, I don't know. For that Basilius, I, I, again, I don't know the history other than just steer well clear. That was, mm. He he got instructions to always keep a muzzle on him. Yeah. But uh, I guess the other time he didn't. So if he's, like, racing him, and this, I mean, this sounds strange, but is there any concern while he's racing? He's going to bite another horse? Like, like anything with that ever I'm, concern? I never heard that. No. No. I was just curious if that would ever like be a worry or something about that, if that would ever happen. Um, so as we talked about previously, quickly, like your father had a huge big thing on EPR. Like he's the reason when our racing started, he brought the guys over from the island back in I think it was the early 70s. Do you guys remember going to EPR as young kids? Oh, I remember yeah. the first time going to EPR. I was so excited. I could tell you what I was wearing. I was seven. So okay. Was 1972. Let's... I yeah. can tell you to this day, I was that excited. <laughs> um, get on the boat and go stay in a hotel. Uh, yeah. 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 And uh, so how did you feel about it, Barbara? Like him coming to St. John to race? Were you pretty excited for that? Like. No, I, I, I didn't mind. Uh, yeah. I used to worry some about him driving so late, you know, after being yeah. overtired probably. But, uh, yeah, he always, always made it home. Yeah, definitely. So, no, I, I, I was concerned about him getting overtired sometimes. Yeah. But, no, I, I, he, that's what he loved doing, and that's, that's where he was going. And, um... and I, I remember going as a kid. Yeah, it was always exciting to go there and even um, – you know, and Alec McPhee's name's going to come up lots because they were great friends. And at that time, yeah. Alec had the Bonnie Bray restaurant in Cornwall. But like, you I, I, you could be there, and there'd be umpteen cars leaving that Saturday to go to the races in St. John. Well, like there was, it, it was never hard to get a ride. Or I remember as that as a kid that it was never hard to get a ride to go to uh, EPR. 
Um, yeah. yeah, and you get over there, and like Bev said, the boat was a big deal, and it's, you know, you connect with people on the boat coming and going. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it was always the, you know, that gets ingrained, I think, in all Islanders that uh, of, of our vintage where you're you're racing to get to, to the boat yeah. um, and worried about getting crowded off the last one. And God, like even and for whatever reason, when cars came off the boat, they would leave their headlights on back in the day. I never understood yeah. why that was. And you'd say, oh, there goes the boat traffic by. You know? <laughs> so do you guys live far from the boat? How far was the boat from you guys? So Fairview um, is well, it'd be ten minutes from Cornwall. So to get from Fairview to Borden, oh, you want probably forty-five minutes. Do you think, Bev? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually lived in uh, I lived in Borden when I was younger in my early twenties. I had a girlfriend who lived there. I lived there for about a year and a half. And uh, winners in Prince Edward Island. Wow. I give give you guys credit because they're not the easiest. Summer's fantastic. Winters, <laughs> woo, man. I was I worked a job and I was on EI in the winter, and I remember her being like, "Get ready because it's gonna be rough." I'm like, no, it won't be. I'm not working. Two weeks in, like, I had to go back to St. John. I can't handle this. <laughs> like, I gotta go home. Come they're back to St. John. Right? There'd be lots yeah. of wind there too. Oh, the storms! I remember the first storm, the drifts and stuff, and it was just yeah. brutal. But I got a really fun picture to show you guys. And I'm sad that Kim's not on here. Maybe I'll get, what I'll do is um, Beverly. I'm going to send you some of these, and you can send them to Kim so she can see them once oh, we're done. Sure. This thing is I don't know if you've seen this, Bev. It's a Christmas wish list that they made in the late '70s. They mentioned your father. Okay, this is a funny one. So I'll tell you the backstory behind it. Um, it might have been Howie Trainer put a thing in the paper in 1977. It's uh all the races, all the drivers' Christmas wishes. And it was like slight, slight sarcasm, but this is kind of fun. So this is what they put in for your father and for your, your husband, Barb. Okay. For Francis McIsaac, no, a, <laughs> a year's supply of chewing tobacco and a permanent table for two at the Mediterranean and a drive in every race from January to December at EPR. <laughs> yeah. Dad loved his tobacco. Yeah. Yeah, I we good? yeah, I remember that. Yeah. I remember that list. Yeah, and my <laughs> my father was in it too. So I got to ask, he must have been a huge fan of the Mediterranean, I'm guessing. Well, they always went out pretty well always. After, a lot of the time after the races, they would go for something to eat. Yeah. 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 Did Paul Dares own the Mediterranean? Oh, God, he got me. I, think, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if he did or not. I remember the big ones being the Mediterranean or Deluxe Fries was another popular yeah. one you'd end up going to. That's... Yeah. Deluxe is still good. The Mediterranean is still good. I had Mediterranean a few weeks ago and it's still really good. It's still there. It's uh it's pretty impressive. But that was a really funny thing. I seen I remember I was like, yeah, I gotta put that in there because that's a really neat thing. <laughs> yeah, I... tobacco was a common thing, and I think it might have been one of our cousins that thought that it was by because he dude like the club, like the plug. Yeah, yeah, the, you know, the rectangular. And I think one of our cousins, it might have been Mark Gonley. Uh, thought this was a chocolate bar and wanted a bite of the chocolate bar. So, of course, it obliged him. I think that ended his tobacco chewing career. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And That's... I think they may have even got pulled over by the Mounties one time because Dad would have a um, yeah, styrofoam, styrofoam cup in the cup. truck that he would spit into with this thing and then leave it on the dash. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I think they got pulled over the Mounties. I said, what's in the cup? And then he checked. I think he just looked in and sniffed and then just walked away. Was, yeah, uh... <laughs> Definitely. That's awesome. Yeah, no, that list is really cool. I'm going to bring up a race, actually. I'm going to bring up a race here of another Maca. I, I had never pronounced this, this horse's name right. But Maca, um, yeah. again, everyone's on mute. If anyone has anything, you know, wave. This You're going to hear this. You can actually hear this. I feel bad now because the other two audio clips you're probably not going to hear. But I'll bring this. This is from Prince of Rhode Island in 1978. This also, Lee, you sent this to me, and I got to send Jerry McCabe. This is from Jerry McCabe. So I definitely want to give him his credit for that. Because, oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah, really rare. Like 1978, anything is really rare. So yeah. here is the race coming up right here. Starters in the seventh race. This is a preferred classification. Number one, Belinky. Trotter in with four pacers. Lem Neal driving. H.H. Carroll, two with Jody Hennessy. Another Macca, three with Francis McIsaac. Four aces, pal with Lois McPhail and Fine Rebel on the outside. Alec McPhee driving. They head into the turn, and here's Fine Rebel. 
digging from the outside for the lead hh carol is up on the inside another market third on the turn racing fourth aces pal with belinky trailing by the first eight here they go on to the quarter fine rebel paces off the top looking good going to the quarter by two and a half lengths on hh carol that's another Macca racing third. Aces Pal is fourth as they go by the quarter. Belenke trots in fifth. Heading into the top turn, racing to the three eights. Fine Rebel by one and three quarters now. By the quarter, 31 and two. H.H. Carroll is second. That's another Macca third. Aces Pal still fourth. And the trotter Belenke is trailing. They're turning for the halfway mark in the seventh now, and it's still Fine Rebel, number five, racing off the top by one and three-quarter lengths to the half. Second, it's still H.H. Carroll back two and a half lengths now. Here's Aces Pal driving the outside and taking third from another Mackin. There by the halfway mark, the trotter races up in there with the Pacers in fifth. Racing for the five eights. Now the seventh race is on the paddock. Turn by the half in a good four and four. Up front, it's still fine. Rebel by one and a half lengths on H.H. H. Carroll. On the outside, Aces Pal third. That's another Mac of fourth and Belinky trailing. Here they go on to the three quarters. Now the Trotter's going to give it a shot. Belinky from five moves up on the outside. They're at the three quarters now and into the top turn. It's Fine Rebel off the top. Five contenders heading for the seven eights. It's still Fine Rebel a length and a half. One thirty six and four fifths down to the three quarters. There's an eight to go. Fine Rebel looks pretty comfortable with the lead. Here they come off the turn now. That is Fine Rebel. Ace is pal on the outside. Here they come. Up on the inside is the, the trotter now as they come home. Look on it. Another Mac on the inside. Here they are. That was really impressive the way he came back at the end. Wow. Yeah. yeah, like comes right up. But that's, that's I think Dan would, would have enjoyed the passing lane. That's, yeah. <laughs> he weaved through traffic, and there's a little more <laughs> passing lanes and more spots to weave through. So. Yeah. No, that was because I had watched that once and I, I thought, I know he doesn't win it. I thought, well, I don't have any, I only have like two of his races, but he comes close. I mean, he's right there at the end, right? So, yeah, sure. really Quite impressive. A thing, there was a, there was, a, was it Blinky was the trotter in with those horses? Was... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, what was, what was the name of the horse? I think it was Blinky. I think, okay. I think that was Ed Water said Blinky's going to give it a try. The trotter was going to give it a try. And yeah, that was quite a trotter to be in with those pacers. Exactly. Yeah. And, God, I wish the EPR would have held on to their footage like these guys did. <laughs> like, if someone gave me something from 78, that quality in EPR, I'd probably drop. I'd be so excited. <laughs> um, oh, it's I'm always searching. So kind of we'll get everybody in because Kim's here on speakerphone and stuff, and kind of everyone can get in on this. Even Barbara, you can too because it's a big part. Um, he was gone a lot working. Obviously, like he was back St. John, Charlottetown. Like, what's your memories of that? Like, you know, he said he was home on, on probably Sundays and Mondays, would it be, you think? Like back then? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, he'd be home on Sundays. Okay. Uh, so and Mondays sometimes it was racing the show now, of course. Yeah. So some See. of the time. And Dad had been in Hinsdale, New York, yeah. um, in the late sixties. So mm -hmm. and so he was gone for I don't know. I don't I don't remember. No, he, he was up there for about six weeks. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think, and uh, also in Halifax, and yeah. he spent some time there, but uh, you know, not, not terribly long, really. And, and for me, like, I don't really remember, like, those trips to St. John, he'd be over and back in the same day or day and a half, mm -hmm. like, or, or that was my memory of it, too. It's not like he was gone for a month. Or like, for my memory on that would be when he went to Montreal, like the Blue Bonnets. He was gone for a big yeah. chunk of the winter there. Yeah. Other than that, yeah, he'd be gone and get back at whatever time at night. Mm -hmm. And I remember um, my mom probably has it still buried away there somewhere, something for school, writing, you know, uh, like a parent's career day kind of thing. And I think I wrote up my understanding of what my father's day would be, and it would be get up really early and then essentially come back really really late and by himself because that was my view on it and, and mom yeah. said, it, the only thing he was by himself pretty much was the drive to town and the drive back because there was umpteen yeah. people jammed into cabs trucks and around barns and yeah. um but yeah like to me especially the epr you could be wrong there wasn't too many times i don't think he stayed over 
Mm. Correct me if I'm wrong on that one, Mom. That's... No, there wasn't. No, most most always go home. No. It's hard to remember him uh, needing to take uh, a rest. So he'd lie down on the couch and he'd fall asleep within seconds and he'd just get a cat nap and then up and he'd be up again, ready to go. Wow. That's right. Fresh as a daisy. I can never figure that out. Yeah. I, I kind of do that now, actually, myself. I don't get a lot of sleep either. Um, that's, that's some dedication right there. I mean, for a guy who just i want to say dominate like i mean wally hennessy i think i told you this lee called him like the michael jordan of uh, harness racing like yeah. wally thinks the world of him just that's quite a really, what he did wally. and it's yeah. uh it's such a great thing to love what you do and oh if yeah you, do, you don't mind putting all the time and hours into it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i definitely get that um let's show a few more pictures while we're out of here let's jump in Let's just grab it. Where are we at? I got a really nice one. You guys have all seen this, but maybe some people haven't seen it. That one yeah. there from the yeah, Ottawa yeah, one. Yeah. Yeah. With Trudeau. Now that's Sasser Trudeau. Is that not Sasser Trudeau on the uh, bike? That's right. Okay. Yeah. That was from, and I'll show this one. This is one you got me sent me there, Lee. This is from Race in a Canal in Ottawa. Yeah. That's a great the, question. The video you sent me, Lee. Yeah, I couldn't get it. It's CBC, and they are, oh, my goodness. If I put that video on, you won't see me for about six months, probably. They'll probably find no, me. No, we don't take want me that. <laughs> CBC is <laughs> very difficult about their footage. They don't want anyone taking it. Um, I'm going to bring up a little video. This is, is this, You guys can see this in here. This is from Russell Henderson. That's the one who does my co-hosting. He's got a really fun little story about your father, and I got a little bit more that I'll add on to the other one there, too. So here it comes here with Russell and coming up now 75 and back then it was very very common for uh people to be hanging over the fence and watching the horses pray mm -hmm. and at the same time they might even uh they might even yell at the drivers are you going to win or something to that effect yeah. looking for a hot tip yeah so on this particular day uh the top class was parading and uh, irish bearing with clive mcdonald driving came sauntering by and Sure enough, somebody yelled over the fence, hey, Clyde, how is he? And Clyde McDonald said uh, something to the effect, uh, he's good, I'm going to win this race for a joke. Well, that was fine, but right behind parading, behind Irish Barham was Francis and another Macca. Yeah. And no sooner did uh, Clyde get the words out of his mouth and Francis looked over at the many people hanging over the fence and said, that's what he thinks, the joke is going to uh -huh. be on him. <laughs> and this was just, and I remember this so vividly, this was just so strange for Francis McIsaac to be responding to people at the fence. Yeah. And uh, what it did is a lot of the people that were, were gathered there start, rushed into the grandstand to, <laughs> uh, to bet some money because it was apparent that, uh, that maybe they were, that Francis was trying to tell them something. Yeah. So a few minutes later, the race, uh, the race took off and uh, sure enough, uh, another macker overtook Irish Baron in the stretch and won the race. Yeah. So awesome. uh, this was one of the few occasions where where Francis uh, where Francis actually uh, uh, was engaged with uh, with the crowd a little bit. That's pretty funny. Yeah, it is. Uh... That is one thing I remember being as a kid and being at the races. And if we were standing down by the fence, yeah. we didn't go very often as kids. Um, no, um, but if you're standing down there, he never looked at us, never looked sideways. Uh, it was all business, all business. business. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I know he was very quiet, man. But then I interviewed three people, and I'm like, he wasn't a quiet man. <laughs> and another definitely... story, another one from St. John, and yeah, uh, his okay. shareholder end of his, his last race, his, he was turning 14. Mm -hmm. Turning 14, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, he was at the end of his career anyway. And dad was winning, I think, a lot of races at that time, so there were some people who necessarily weren't as happy about all of that. Yeah. Anyway, shareholder and won, and I think they booed him in the winner's circle. And dad just pat reached up, tapped the yeah. horse in the rear end, and <laughs> away they went. So. Russell tells that story. That's the, that's the next story that Russell oh, tells. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He tells that story. So everyone will hear that again. And Russell, and it's literally the exact same way you said it. 
Oh. That uh, and me and I think me and John talked about it where um, like people that's just people being jealous. People like success. You see it all the time. I'm a huge football fan. My favorite team is Kansas City, and I've been a fan all my life. And I mean, no one said a word about Kansas City for 20, 20 years. I was a fan. All of a sudden, they become good, and everyone hates them all of a sudden, except for the fans. I'm like, what? Why were you hating us when we were like horrible? But that's what it is. People get really, you know, your Francis was a great driver. Let's just put it that way. That's why he was so good. Yeah. You know, that's why he won so much. And like you said, he was very serious, all about business. But obviously, seemed like a very nice man. Just you know, on the track, all about business. Um, let's see, let's see where we're at here. I'm kind of just, kind of just going along with the. Um, I got a lot of pictures. I'm going to show you this one. I don't. You guys have probably all seen this. I don't know if you've seen this, Barbara, or not. This was taken by a guy in St. John. I want to give him credit, Bob Boudreaux. This is not my picture. Um, this right here. Have you ever seen that, Barbara? Uh, I don't think so. No. Yeah, that was taken. There's Francis right there. My father is kind of peeking in the background there. <laughs> He's in the back. <laughs> but the guy that does it, he takes incredible pictures all around St. John. And um, he took that picture. That was in May of 78. And there he is with the no gloves, which, again, we can talk about that all day. <laughs> Talk about a tough man, like no gloves. And I mean, that's maybe I heard like middle of winter, no gloves. Yeah. That's his old uniform as well. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great, I'd never seen that, but that's your screen that saver or your background that's... image, I think, Scott, is it? Yeah. That's a background on this one. So when I, when we, you can kind of see it creeping up there a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, that was yeah. the first time I'd seen it in one of the earlier podcasts. Yeah. I hadn't seen that picture before. That's... It's, oh, I, someone, I found it. I think I seen it like on a, a it wasn't on a racing page, and it was like whoa. And I, I'm so what I do is I'm crazy. The second I see somebody with seventy, so I message the guy right away and start harassing him. Like, you got any more seventy stuff? And he's like, I got like two pictures. You got any more? You no, know, you got any more? Like, people are gonna start like saying, don't talk to this guy because he just bugs us for seventy stuff. And I will. <laughs> if I have any idea you have seventy stuff, I will. I'll come to your house. I'll travel the provinces. I don't care. <laughs> I went to Moncton to get in to get the Monctonia from nineteen eighty five. I drove with my girlfriend. And I get in the car. It's like, really? We drove to Moncton for one tape. I'm like, yeah. So what? It's like it's one tape. I'm like, it doesn't matter. Uh, here's a couple more pictures. The Mother's Day Invitational. Someone give me some back. If anyone knows any background on that one, there. We we have that picture. Yeah, we do. I don't know anybody in that picture other than Dad. Uh, what horse is it? Yeah, I don't. Yeah. No, I'm not sure. When I scanned that one, there, there's. Like some of the pictures, we just we don't have the names on the back of them. Yeah, no, no problem. But it was clearly uh, EPR, and it's the classic EPR sky going on there in the background. Yeah, in the background. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, let's see another one here. Most wins in '76. There he yeah. is. There, and like a big. He was a big guy. How how tall was your dad? Eleven, I think. Yeah, he wasn't six so. feet. No, he's not. really. Yeah, but he was big. He was rugged, really. Yeah, 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 definitely. Like the three brothers, I think Clifford might have been six three, like Dad and his two brothers. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, I remember Dad being five eleven, and I think Raymond was like five five with his hands in the air, kind of thing. So they all kind of <laughs> had quite a step ladder across them. There's another one I'm gonna show, and then we'll get into some. This is where's it at? It's this one here. That's a, I love that picture. I it's just too. yeah. Yeah, him and Marcel Barrio, I think it is, yeah. And that's Wally McGinnis holding that horse on the right, I think. Yeah. The question about that is, does anyone have any idea why there's policemen there? Because I keep seeing them in the old 70s pictures. I don't, I'll have to ask someone in, in the EPR page. But there's always, like, policemen. Are they, like, worried something's going to happen? I don't It's very odd. But know. someone thought... What was the question? The policemen. I don't uh -huh. know. And the, and the tall, gray-haired man at the end there, it seems to me I asked who that was. But uh, Francis didn't seem to have any. He I didn't know him or it's some other comment. I don't know. I've seen him in other pictures. He's actually, I have a picture of my, uh, of Scott's Gauman. That was my grandfather's horse. And there's a, there a bunch of, and I'm pretty sure that guy's in that picture. He might have been like some kind of secretary, possibly, at EPR. Um, yeah. Or he may have. You may have like going out to get his picture taken. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah definitely. Don't worry. Once I upload this, we'll find out within minutes. Because trust me, everyone's gonna be like, "Oh yeah, Absolutely. this is this yeah. is who it is. This is when he was born. This is his favorite horse. This is the kind of series he smoked." Like everyone will tell you right away, instantly. It's pretty quick. Put cut a draw. Um, 
so I'm kind of just like, you know, not really winding down, but like any fun stories you want to tell about them? Like you guys would just go with it, whatever you want to go with, like any funny stories about them, stuff like that. I remember it, it, when, when we talked about the phone calls uh, and when he first went to Blue Bonnets, um, he, of course, Dad and Alec McPhee would, would tease each other, but I remember Dad asking uh, before he was about to call Alec for something, um, and this was when he'd just been to Montreal, so he was back home. And uh, just to get a rise out of Alec, he asked Bev or Kim or probably both of them, because you know, he I assume he did it multiple times, how you say the word horse in French. So when Alec answered the phone, he fired off a couple of words in French. And then I don't know how many he planned to say, but he just ended the laughing. And so, they just, huh. you know, they, they, they had a lot of fun. They worked hard, but they had a lot of fun with each other. Yeah, definitely. Um, I know Joe or Marcel said it was almost like when he went to Montreal, that was like going to work because EPR was almost like being on vacation. He worked hard, but everybody got along. I, from what I've heard, like, and definitely with Francis, I mean, I heard, very like patient person with horses and on the track like he wouldn't get upset he would just you know if something happened on the track he'd leave it on the track kind of thing which to I me mean, can happen it's competitive yeah. and i think with anyone in that kind of any sport you have to be competitive to be good because if you're not then you know you're cool with finishing last basically right um this is the one that you sent me and this is one people i think this is crazy the bobby or pace yeah that's great picture yeah, That's Doug Caldwell, too. Bobby yeah. Orr, Wally McGinnis, Dad, Miss St. John. I'm not sure who the other two gentlemen are. They may have been with the Exhibition Association. I'm not sure. I think, I, this, as the story goes, Wally was a tremendous Boston Bruins fan. Mm -hmm. And when they get into the winner's circle there, uh, Wally looked at Bobby Orr and uh, motioned to the horse and said, this fellow's got the same problem as you, bad knees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's awesome. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was true and honest. I think that was, yeah, I don't know yeah. if he was another Australian or New Zealand horse or not. But... Yeah, that was a horse that pulled really hard. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. He was really tough to drive. And I remember when Dad sold that horse in Montreal. Got that story coming up. I'll tell oh, you off. Okay. No, I'll tell you off. No, me. I got. To, I'll tell the story because I know exactly. You got. You know everything, Bev. I should have put you on the, the host. You got all the. You got all the answers. But I already cut you off. I'm sorry because I'm going to play that in a no, second because no. yeah, you know perfect. the story. Because <laughs> I'm going to show one more picture. I got a black and white version of that picture, but oh no, that's not it. Here it is. That's not. It. Never mind. I'll have to, there it is. This is what I'm looking for. So is that you in the front, Lee? Right there. Yeah, and I think that's Montreal. Is that that it is. is. Yeah. Oh, that's wrong. That's, that's I'm wrong. That I thought it was about it. you look very yeah, no. not impressed. <laughs> you don't look happy. Lee. No, I don't think I'm at the very front there. That's Sterling and Roma Taylor on the right, and maybe Harold and Jeff. Lee's uh, right in front of Mom there. Okay. The there you go. My bad. My bad. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Here's, I can get it of sorts, but I don't think I can get that out, Lee, by the look on Jeff there. That's... Yeah. That's Montreal. So John Proud, of course, holding the horse. And yep. that's Sid, Sid Shea, uh, Joey Shea's dad, um, at the back behind dad. They lived in Montreal. And Sid mm -hmm. is originally from PEI, yeah, I think. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. His family. Or his family was. Yeah. And that was, a, that was a big trip. To, we took the train up to Montreal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No heat on the train. March break. No, no heat on the train. Wow. <laughs> that's, Yeah. That's I, I got that wrong. I thought that was the Bobby Orr pace. That's definitely not the Bobby Orr pace, but I got that. Yeah. And we have another picture here. This is just a clipping. McIsaac takes EPR driver championship. That kind of became normal after a while for him, I guess. Like he wins 76, 77, 78. So does he come home after 78? He's like, yeah, I won another one. Just like, just hands you a trophy, Barbara. Just, just put it up on the uh, with the rest of them kind of thing, right? Yeah, we, we must have it here because he, he did win it two or three times over there. Yeah. driving championship yeah right. and he he won it in 77 and 78 also in charlottetown which like that's and i we get into that later i got another clip of that talking to wally about it that's crazy that he wins in both tracks that's going to be unheard of to win the driving championship in both tracks in the same year well the number of horses like i, I remember being there when the sheet first came out for the St. John entries. And I think there was 12 races and dad was listed to drive 14 times. Like he would drive so many races. And um, I think I remember, I forget who was telling us at one point, but um, in 78, 79, mm -hmm. 
they did a count and they figured uh, he had 77 or 73 horses racing at racetracks between wow. Charlottetown, St. John, and Blue Bonnets. Yeah. Um, so that doesn't include all the horses like brood mares and foals and the multiple ones that wouldn't have been racing uh, that mm -hmm. were all over the place. And, and now they certainly weren't. You know, it was a public stable, so it's not like Dad owned them all, but there'd be. Uh, he owned some of them for sure and had a lot of great owners. Like I started to list some names of owners and just stopped because I knew I was going to miss yeah. too many of them. Um, yeah. But yeah, there was a lot of horses in the go and that meant a lot of driving um, to get the, yeah, just the number of starts back then on short seasons too. It's, yeah. That, well, yeah, because they didn't have winter. Uh, they weren't doing winter races in Charlton, I don't think. Were they back then? I don't think so. No. no, no, no. That's why I went to St. John because they yeah. didn't race here. And with it, that, then there was a lot of really important people in the background, I guess. Uh, oh, yeah. Working, oh, yeah. Working for Dad. So um, there was a lot that came through the barn doors over the years. Like John Proud definitely was a big one. Oh, Wally sure. McGinnis. I mean, uh, you have Wally McGinnis, Toby McDonald, George Goody, uh, yeah. Ernie McDonald, Allie McDonald Allie. went down to Hinsdale with Dad. Um Gary um, McDonald worked for Dad for a while, and Mike McDonald also worked yeah. uh, for Dad. Uh, Sanford Campbell, mm -hmm. Hector White, uh, Carolyn Weber, yep. Maggie, I forget Maggie's last name. I don't think I, anyone ever knew how to pronounce her last name. No, I guess that's the, <laughs> that's the key there. Uh, yeah. Bernie Berrigan, Kenny Murnion. Yeah. Oh, uh, Bernie Bearcat Berrigan. That's one yeah. I did jot down. Um, so he, he, I remember we were, I went to St. John. It was one of the first trips I went. So uh, with dad and Bearcat in the truck. So we're coming off the boat and uh, going over. And uh, dad would ask, you know, if, if you were on the right hand side and the truck and the turn was angled right and you couldn't really see the traffic, he'd ask whoever was sitting there to see, is there any traffic coming? But he'd rarely say traffic. He might say, he might say, are there any cars? Are there any buses? Are there any trains coming? Just kind of, you know, whatever is top of mind. So we come off the boat, and that's when the cars were coming down from the top ramp and the trucks were coming out from underneath. And Dad said to Bearcat, are there any buses coming? And Bearcat turned and said, nope. And Dad kept going. And then the, there was a stream of cars coming. So there was horns going and cars, <laughs> and the brake sets, and Dad's ripping a strip off a of Bearcat. I asked you if there was any, anything coming. He said, you asked if there's any buses coming. There's no buses coming. There's all kinds of cars, but no buses. So, and that's that's just, you know, something like that would happen, I think, for every trip where there was one hill they used to clear. And I think there was, when they cleared it, they ran out of gas and were able to coast to the bottom to right to the tank. But it was, yeah, I remember that with Bearcat. Mm -hmm. And uh, another stalwart um, we knew more as a kid, too, would have been John Doyle, who worked in the barn. Uh, and he spent a lot of time out at the farm. He wasn't at the track for sure. And uh, John was deaf. And uh, I always thought it was brilliant. He had a, a, a hearing aid, uh, but he'd keep the barn immaculate. So he'd be scraping an aluminum shovel on the concrete <laughs> floor, and the noise would just deafen you. And he'd just turn off his hearing aid. And away he'd go. <laughs> yeah. well, that's great. That's good. But yeah, stuff. to Bev's point, there, there was a, a lot of people that came through those barns, and, and Dad would be the first one to say, like you don't win those races without those folks. Like they talk yeah. about racing luck, but you know, I know I'm a believer that uh, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of work and preparation went in um, to winning those races. And to credit a lot of the, the drivers we've seen and talked to uh, in old home week, who've won, you know, the, the driving championship that's renamed after dad, they all yeah. say a lot of the similar things, similar things. So that humility, uh, goes kind of hand in hand with a lot of the success, uh, and and it just speaks to the people as an industry. So uh, uh, it, it's a good industry to be a part of. So we've met a lot of great people through it. Yeah, definitely, and it helps a lot. I mean, I know in the island with all the horses and all the farms and stuff, it almost makes us a little jealous in New Brunswick, like you know, because yeah. I'm just the way you guys. Um, I just said it before when I watched um, Red Shores, and just watch the way it's produced, and it's just such a class act, especially you know. And I was going to get into it later, but I mean, it's been 40 years later and you're like, Francis is still remembered with that and with the McIsaac race in St. John. It shows that, you know, some businesses don't really remember their past, but they definitely do in harness racing and they have a lot of respect for him. 
Yeah, and I think Kim was going to chime in there. She's on their yeah. cell phone connection. Here. Sure, go ahead, Kim. Yeah, no, Lee, that was, uh, those were great thoughts that you had there. And thinking about all the road trips that Dad had with his friends. And um, honestly, when when you go back, what connects them all, that love of and their commitment to the horse racing industry, it has given us a lot of great memories. Definitely. Uh, yeah, and the stories keep going, like those those trips in the winter where the roads wouldn't be great. Yeah, I think I think a horse's leg actually fell through the back of that truck at some point. The horse didn't get hurt, but they hauled it back up and ripped a sign off a signpost somewhere and nailed it up <laughs> on the bottom of the truck that I think Dad bought from George Murphy. And you'd see this sign nailed under the bottom of it. <laughs> yeah. And even I think. Uh, yeah, mom might have more details on this one too. They they were leaving home and there was a hill not far from Fairview where they couldn't get up because it was too icy with the truck. So they got a hold of somebody else, found a truck that they could get to the top of the hill, took the horses off one truck, walked them up the hill onto another truck, and away they went from there. Yeah, I, I forget that story, but I was thinking uh, this is not so much about Hearns racing. John Doyle, when he was terribly, terribly deaf, really. But he did like to bet a little bit, and he went to the races uh, after he'd do his late evening work here, because he was always late at the... Uh, anyway, uh, Francis asked him to uh, just go up there and turn the tractor off. And, and he, he was thinking about the races. John was thinking about the races, and he said to Francis, you want to try actor? <laughs> 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 we, all, we always laughed at, at that story for sure. <laughs> That's funny. And John, That's... did John, a horse got loose here one day and dad wasn't home and you were uh, uh, panicking a bit trying to get this horse and John said to you, oh, it doesn't matter, he's lame anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he's going out on the, on the road where there's lots of traffic. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I heard a story about my grandfather's horse, get, I don't know if you got it, they found him on McAllister Drive once. I think they were all down at the barns doing whatever, maybe partying afterwards. And someone called my, I don't know if it was Scott's Gauman or somebody else, said, your horse is on McAllister Drive. They left the, they left the door open and the horses wandered out. Straight down <laughs> McAllister Drive. I'm thinking, you're lucky that thing get hit by a car. You're lucky it's not now because that would happen now. It would be now. Yeah, yeah. Or, I mean, it would be all over Twitter like an instant. Boom, there's a horse That's walking right. on McAllister Drive. But I've seen some crazy, strange things happen at the barn. I, I think I remember slightly a horse being loose. And kind of just like everyone, like, I don't know what it was, but yeah, it's it's pretty funny. They got loose this lane. Yeah. Just let it go. Just let it do its thing. Um, I have another clip that hopefully we can all hear. And thought, I'll send it to you, Bev, if you can't hear it anyway. Sure. And okay. I'm going to fix them all up. But hopefully we hear this one here is John Proud telling the story that you were going to tell, Bev, that I cut you off on. Okay. But this yeah. is him telling the story about, uh, what was the name of the horse again? The horse they sold? In my, in blue bonnets. Oh, true, oh, and true and honest. True and honest. Yeah. yeah. Here, here it comes. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. And we, we get done with that true and honest. Yeah. Anyway, he he after he found out he could use the tranquilizer, mm -hmm. he raced. He went two or three races with him, and he was getting in. He was going to be in too tough, so he put him in a flaming race. Okay. And he lost. We lost him, but he claimed him. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Uh, this this day, we're walking up to the yard. Uh, we're going up to watch a horse train. Yeah. Sim, him and I are walking up to the fence to watch this horse train. And this guy that claimed, true and honest, he come off the track going 100. <laughs> <laughs> and he couldn't get him stopped. Anyway, he run him into the barn door. <laughs> That's the only way he get him stopped. He run him right into the barn door. Bam! <laughs> And oh, geez, that that was something that Francis didn't like. So anyway, he walks over there, and he said, uh, "Wow," he said. He said he, he is hard to control, and but he didn't say a word. Yeah. And he said, "I'll tell you what you can do uh, to help you out." He said to him. Yeah. And but he said, uh, well, "Tell me something." Francis said, yes, what's that? He said, uh, did you not get the check? He said, for when we claimed this horse, did you not get paid for it? Yeah. Well, you don't own them now, he said. 
So I don't think you guys, you guys, could you guys hear it? Could you hear yeah. it at all? Okay. I could. It was pretty faint. I had to turn up the volume a bit here. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna the thing about it. So, Bev, you can tell because you were gonna tell the story, so you can tell a little bit more about it. But it's yeah, basically no, I, what happened. I, I, I'm sure that John has it, has it all covered the very same. But uh, it was yeah. uh, it was a good story. Yeah. Now, the, other, the other Montreal story too. I think was Winter Storm A was racing. Dad had did, needed dental work done. And yeah. when he moved to Montreal, and there was a dentist there who attended the races quite a bit, and uh, Dad met the dentist, told him he needed teeth work, and, and uh, the dentist said to him, uh, "Good tippy, good teethy." <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that after that exchange about uh, uh, true and honest, where. The guy that claimed him said, yeah, don't want your advice. You can get lost kind of thing. A couple of weeks later, I think he was around asking Carolyn Weber what to do with that horse. Because Carolyn was the trainer for dad there, but she'd never worked with him. Yeah. And uh, he said, well, if you need something to know about that horse, you have to ask Francis. So, yeah, it was, that would have been the end of that discussion. That's... Well, it's funny because um, John says later in that clip, he says, um, like he only raced like three other times. I think they barred him from, from the track or something. The horse, like something happened, but it ended up working out for your, for Francis definitely in the end. Um, but yeah, it's just it's a funny story. And I know the volume. Like I said, when I get the volume fixed on them for watching this, it's gonna be a lot louder because I'll definitely get it okay. done. Um, but John again, will tell the stories for sure. Yeah. Oh, he he's great. We have like I have, about, I have about a half an hour with John. And I, I cut off the best part. I'm going to find it. And I'm going to tell the story here. And I'm going to kind of give it away. So John and your father are in Montreal. And it's like 70. When would it have been when he was in Montreal? 78? 77? 78, 70, 78 and 79. Yeah. 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 So they're there. And John's, in the, John's up in the grandstand watching the race. And with this guy. And I guess like back then, because I'm only one, so I don't remember. But it's like, that's fur hats and fur coats were a big deal. Does that ring a bell? It was big. Didn't he? Thing. I'm pretty sure Dad bought a fur coat or some sort. Did he not? Well, he never did get that coat. <laughs> oh, okay. he, but the... he he put the money down on it, and he's mm -hmm. going going to go back to to get it. And uh, the guy with the store knew nothing about it. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, <laughs> that geez. probably doesn't need to be part of the podcast. No, <laughs> that's, that's well, we didn't we didn't mention the store, so that's all right. We if we don't mention the store, <laughs> yeah. we're fine. <laughs> Um, I guess John is, is up there and he's got this big, like this guy's wearing this big fur coat and this big fur hat. It's like a big thing. It's all elaborate looking. So I don't know what horse Francis wins, but he wins. And John says he comes down to the winner's circle, get his picture taken. And I guess Francis looked at him and like, just is like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> like the look on his, he said the look on his face was priceless. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> Like, Too bad they don't have the winter circle picture for that. <laughs> really, and I think he said like either they didn't get it, but it was really funny. And it's funny because when I went to edit, I couldn't find it. I'm like, where I lost that, but I have the original voice copy, so I'm gonna find it and put it in. And the way John tells it's great, like just the way Francis looks, I'm like, what in the world are you looking at? Like you're looking like an idiot. Um okay, let me just kind of I'm just like, you know, kind of just gonna wait now, guys, to be honest. I mean, if you got more stories you want to tell. Funny stories, interesting. You know, there was lots of young horses around too. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because there there was horses. Well, with that many horses, there was horses of every stripe and age and category. Um, but yeah, I remember being at least seeing, and then again, it's a kid looking at your father too. But being good with young horses, yeah, and just being steady. Um, yeah. But I also remember being at it would have been one of the. I'm not sure when they started the yearling sales in Charlottetown. Um, it would have been. One of the first few, but I remember going there with dad. And again, lots of buzz and people around and lots on the go. And he was in a conversation with four or five of them. And he was waiting to bid on a horse. And the horse in the ring um, wasn't getting a bid. And it was taking forever. And a lot of times, you know, at least if, some, if the bidding gets started, then it'll get going and they'll finish. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting there. And uh, yeah, probably nine or ten. And uh, he just turns to me. Did the bidding start in that horse on there when nobody's bidding? He just puts up his hand 500 and then goes back to the conversation. And then wow. the next thing, the guy from the sale is standing there with the clipboard because no one else 
that bit on the horse. Yeah. And, and he interrupts his conversation again. And then he turns to me and says, did anybody else bid on that horse? I'm um, there, no. And then he just, damn it. So, so he signs for it. <laughs> and, and in true fashion, because this was the literally the horse trading and how many horses bought and sold. Um, like before he left, at that time, it would have been the Kennedy Coliseum. Um, he sold the horse to somebody else. I don't know if he even knew what the name on it was. But <laughs> like mom would have a better take on that or an awareness of it of just the number of half of this horse or a third of this horse or in somebody's name but owned by somebody else. There was a, yeah, there, there was a, a lot of combinations. And, and it was a way for a lot of people to get ownership in horses too. Like uh, back then and, and uh, um, I think that's one of the things that will be a benefit of, of some of the – the syndicates now that let people get a share in a horse because there's nothing quite like seeing your own horse in a race oh yeah um, but back then you could drive around the countryside and you just see you know this person owned a horse and that person owned a horse they're half in half out it's just one more draw for the community to come to watch a race yeah. um but it's also wasn't quite as expensive then as it is now but uh ownership is key because like i say um when it's your own horse racing, it, it makes a difference. Oh yeah, definitely. So Barbara, do you do you remember him just constantly buying horses? It was a pretty frequent thing, I'd imagine, back then, right? Yeah, sometimes they were bought before I ever knew a thing about it. <laughs> <laughs> it was hard to keep track of them all. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I think he was he was getting better at it. You know, as time went along, we'd yeah. uh, send out bills on Sunday night. You know, I'd okay. sit down and, and I would think, uh, I can't wait on the Beverly's old enough to do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you and Dad struck up a deal with uh, Brave Stella, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, her, yeah but uh, I wouldn't put that in. <laughs> no, but her winnings. Yeah. You got her winnings. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a long story. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And did they rename one? Did Alec and Alec McFean dad buy one and rename it A and B something for Audrey oh, yes, and Barb? Yes, yes. That was uh, because they knew they knew Audrey and I, neither one of us would want them buying another horse. <laughs> so they put it in our name to keep us keep us happy. <laughs> Very romantic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think it ever did very well, so they must have got rid of it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to jump in. How about we throw another race on? I have a sure. second race. Yeah. This one here is not totally sure of the horse again. It's funny. I actually had the wrong race up, and I just realized it around 1.30 before we started recording, so I had to go grab this and get it uploaded. So here it comes right here. Exactor wagering on the eight. The starters are number one, Annie's Paradise. Hennessy. Number two, John the Third tonight, pacing with Hobbles, Emmett Burner driving. Number three is Carolyn D with Angus McPhee. Number four, Dean Reveler with Francis McIsaac. And number five is Armbro Sally driving his Blois McPhail. Here they are. They're off now, and here comes number four, Dean Reveler, scalding from the outside. Carolyn D also leaves out up along the inside. John the third grabs third, racing fourth on the turn. Annie's Paradise and Armbro Sally trails. They go by the eighth and up front. Dean Reveler leads by a length and a half. Carolyn D placed second in along the rail. That's John the third driving third of the quarter, racing out of fourth is number one, Annie's Paradise. Armbro Sally has had enough for fifth. The mare is on the move. The four year old takes over fourth on the outside. Coming up now to challenge for third. They're into the top turn, driving on to the three eights. By the first quarter, Dean Reveler off the top. Carolyn D still second. As they move on the turn, racing by the three eights, they will buy the first quarter in 32 seconds even. As they turn for the half, Dean Reveler, the pace setter, sitting second, it's still Carolyn D. John the third, holding third to the half, racing out of fourth through the stretch now. It's number five, Armbro Sally, and trailing the field by the half, number one, Annie's Paradise. Into the paddock turn, racing for the five-eighths, Dean Reveler. 
Number four races off the top. Now here is John the third. Watch yourselves, gentlemen. John the third coming up second on the outside. Carolyn D driving third. Here comes Armbrose. Sally fourth. Annie's Paradise trailing. They were by the half in five and one. Racing it along the rail. Dean Reveler holding ahead on John the third. Armbrose Sally paces the outside. Third now. Carolyn D fourth in along the rail. Third now by a nose. And Annie's Paradise is trailing 136 and 3 the three quarters. John the third gets the lead by three parts of a length on the outside. Dean Reveler now second on the outside. Armbrose Sally driving hard. As they come home, Armbrose Sally trying to catch John the third. They struggle it out. Armbrose Sally gaining a little ground, but not enough as John the third wins by a length and a half. That Armbrose Sally with Carolyn D. You know what I found great about that race? It was the announcer telling them, like, he didn't miss a beat. Like, watch yourself, gentlemen, when he was talking. They're on the like, back stretch there. I think something was happening. The horse made a skip there at the 5.8, I think. Yeah. yeah, and just didn't miss a beat. Like, that's phenomenal. Love that. It's in Love waters. That. Ed yeah. waters. Yeah. Great. Mm. That horse, Actually, Dean Reveler, I remember that horse. That's the first, I remember first horse I was, uh, did a training trip with. I'd be sitting on Dad's lap, and that horse was blind in one eye. Yeah. And really? Just, yeah. And he'd just say, watch him, he'd bear in, and sure enough, he would. Um, and I remember he was a challenge to load that horse. They'd have a hard time loading him. He wasn't a mean horse by any means, but because he was blind in one eye, he was always trying to shimmy around so he could see what, what he could hear. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I remember that because, yeah, just getting some horses loaded, you, there was some aerobatics getting that done. But uh, um, yeah, I remember Dean Rebler. Nice. That's very cool. Um, any memories of that, Bev or Barbara? Or no, I just remember that he was blind in one eye. That's about all I remember about him. Yeah, yeah. And that was nice. I think that was Angus McPhee driving in there too. That's good to see Angus's name. That's... Yeah, them old races are great. I know the uh, eight millimeter. I want to find some audio to put to it. Um, so I'm going to go through some pictures here and. I might show some twice if I do. Then, just, if you have memories of these horses, like I'm going to show this one first. This is actually the Trot Magazine photo. When did that one come out? September '79. That, yeah. that was after he passed. Okay. Okay. Yes, yeah, so they had done an article. They'd been to the house here and done an article mm -hmm. uh, on Trot Magazine. And then they went into the track and took that picture. That, that is a great picture. It's a very nice picture. Yeah, definitely. And again, the no gloves. We have the Mother's Day Pace. Most wins, we went through that. So let's see. Here he is here. I can see a thousand win at EPR in 1977. Now, who's with them? Is that you, Leo? I don't know who that is. You know what? i never seen that picture until I was going through some of the albums to get pictures for you. And there's a message. I think the name of that kid is Kevin Mitchell. It might be in the... The credits been, there, yeah, possibly. And the, the pictures in St. John, and I didn't know this. Is it? Oh, there's. It's an Adios horse, Bev. But I think it was the thousand win was in Moncton, was it? I understood he won his thousandth race in Moncton with T. Joe Adios. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm not totally sure. To be, I got his total wins. I know his total wins in total was thirteen hundred and ninety one, which is very impressive. Very impressive for a man who started at 26 and only raced for well, half a decade and a half. Yeah. This yeah. one here. You may have to do some research on that last picture, Scott, because there's a reference to that Kevin Mitchell being a distribution manager or something in St. John. I, I, yeah. I don't know who that person is. That's it. I'll zoom it in. I'll, I'll take a look at it there, Larry. Yeah. This one here is the lead drivers, 1977. Steve Mahar, Francis in the middle, and I forget who's in that, who that is on the Steve Mason. Side. Steve Mason. Okay. Yeah. One rookie of the year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's like the golden era of EPR. You can see all the people up in the stands and stuff with the grandstand. That's really cool. Um, this one here, Maritime Championship Race. What, where's that? Is that from Sackville, is it? Lee? That is. Yes, 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 it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So did he win he that one too? He did. He did. Yeah. Wow. That was a beautiful trophy. We still have, well, we have a majority of the trophies here still. Yeah. Uh, and I'd be afraid. I'm not sure that I could name them all. Uh, I think Earl Smith's on the far right. The only one I could pick out. 
Yeah, Again, that's a little tough. it's uh, Joe Smallwood, Dougie Walsh. Um, there's a Ratchford there. And unfortunately, I can't name them all. Oh, yeah. No, you got but more than I would have got. So you're good. There's another one coming up here. See, I think it's the same thing. There it is there. There's Hunter yeah. Championship. Yeah. And I think dead. that's that same night. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Dead Heat, Stormy Blue, Bobby Orwin. Trying Championship. Oh, this one here is a nice one. I got this from Bruce Maxwell. This is 80. Oh, I guess 82. Or 80, it might be. I think it's actually 83, because I'm pretty sure I have that race. That's the Francis McIsaac Memorial race back in the early 80s. Yeah, and oh, Jimmy Do okay. Mo Doherty won it, and that's Mo Doherty's large family with him there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that was the year I was graduating from high school, so I think our prom was that night, so I wasn't there that year. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, Bruce, like, the man with everything. I always tease him. What are you going to give me today, Bruce? This guy, like, oh, do you want this? Like, it's just 8 millimeter from the 70s. Like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> Honestly, do you know me? What do you think if I want it or not? And he gave me that. He, I was sitting in his uh, his little TV room. We were just chatting it up. Yeah, I found this picture, and he just hands it to me. I'm like, my goodness, like you have everything. And I, there was a little crack in it, and it's funny because I was going to take it out, but I thought, no, because I'm not cutting myself. I'm not that dedicated to cut myself okay. to get that out. <laughs> so you see the little crack in the middle there, but it's a very cool picture. And Columbo Seals, as Kim mentioned, her favorite horse. You know, just that one there. And let's take a look here. We have that. That's from 79 Charlottetown. And I'm going to, I got one more clip to go over. And again, it's audio. So I apologize, Bev. And um, all good. I'm so sorry, Barbara. <laughs> I lost my name for a second there. It's a little low, but again, I'll give you everything in high quality so you can hear all of it. So here's one. Okay. This is Wally McGinnis. This is a quick story about, about Francis. Francis, back to Francis, too. I told me and um, John were talking. I mean, Francis won just, like, he won 70. He won the, I think I'm very interested with Francis. He wins yeah. Driver of the Year in 76, 77, 78, and also wins, I think it was 78 and 79 in Charlottetown. So he's yeah, going between both tracks, winning. Like, that's no, unheard no, of. I know. No, no, like, you, a lot of people didn't realize the operation that we had, eh? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Like if Francis didn't come over, I did the driving, eh? Yeah, yeah. I seen your name a lot in there too. Yeah, definitely. And, and uh, the other way, and, and you know, one thing about Francis, Francis wasn't hard on a horse. Mm -hmm. For a guy to win so many races, mm -hmm. Francis was never hard on a horse. Yeah. And I mean that. Yeah, patient. Very. Don said he was very patient with horses, even like when oh, that yeah. horse bit him, he didn't freak out. He just kind of like yeah. went about his business. Uh, Oh, yeah. And um, when I was speaking to Dawn, I was talking about how. And we lost it. That's my edit. My editing skills were not good on that one. I apologize. For everyone <laughs> listening, you're going to hear the whole thing. So. Um, and like Wally can tell a story, too. That's, you, pick, you picked a couple of good ones to interview. Both John and Wally are good to tell a story. That's it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they were great. I'm looking forward to. I'm going to run that through and bring the audio back up on it and get it so everyone can hear it because it's a little low and I just did it with my phone. That's all I really did, right? So yeah. it was funny when I was talking to Wally, uh, my girlfriend called midway through and the beep, you could hear it. <laughs> like Wally's telling me a story and it's beeping. And I'm like, oh my God. I'm looking at the phone. I'm going like, come on, man. And then I went to edit. I heard the beep. Like, I got to take that out. I called him like, yeah, I was doing a phone interview. So I didn't know that. I'm like, that is true. <laughs> I should have told you that, but so, yeah, I mean, if you guys have stuff you want to add, everyone, Kim, Lee, Barbara, Bev, whatever you like to say, I'm no, going. No, no, nothing that comes to mind right away. Yeah. Bev, Lee, Kim? I, just, I think we're very fortunate to have uh, been raised in the, involved in the industry. There's a lot of great people, a lot of great memories, and uh, I think we're very fortunate. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd echo Bev's sentiments for sure. It's, uh, um, it's, it would, it's a difficult industry to explain to people who've never been around it, Definitely. but they don't have to be around it for long to understand it and understand mm -hmm. the good people that are part of it and the trials and tribulations. Like the, for every horse that makes it to the races, there's so many that don't, and the work that goes into them, and 
And uh, I think Bev had mentioned earlier, it's more of a lifestyle than an occupation for folks. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's uh, uh, it, it's we've been very fortunate to have the associations we, we've had. And Kim, yeah. do you want to add anything to it? There? Oh, go ahead. I was, go ahead. Sure. No, I would echo Bev and Lee's sentiments there. We uh, have been so fortunate, and uh, the uh, all the people that we've met uh, and the stories that we've heard, they were just blessed by. Yeah, no, I understand. Definitely. And I just, I do have to give mom a shout out. There's no doubt about it. I mean, dad was on the road a lot, whether he was racing in Hinsdale or back and forth to St. John and uh, um, had stable of horses in town and so many horses here and running the farm. And uh, boy, he was pretty lucky. Yeah. Sure. Was. sure. Strong well, woman, I'll well, give you that. that. Yeah, but, uh, I, I was, I, I wasn't a person that could handle a horse or anything like that. But I always enjoyed going to the races that Francis was in. But uh, I'm not as avid a fan as some people are, except for the the races that Francis drove in himself. Well, definitely. And, and uh, that was that was the most fun, really. It's it's a big excitement. I mean, I I know from my father being involved in it and. Just, I didn't see him race a lot of races. I don't want to kind of bring it on to him, but I remember him winning one time. I remember it like it was yesterday being in the grandstand EPR. And I mean, I never ran so fast in my life to get down there to get my picture taken. <laughs> they, they probably thought someone was chasing me because <laughs> I was just like, boom, through people I'm just running through. And it's, it, it like you said, like it is a, like people, some people don't understand it and think they kind of have this perception of harness racing that's not always the best, but it's so different than what people think. I mean, these men love these horses. Like, like you said, like your father loved the animals. My father loved his horse. They all love horses. And they all treat them with, like, some people will have the theory that they're not treated well. They treat it pretty good. A lot of these horses are treated very, very well. And these men loved them and gave their life to it. I mean, you know, my father loved it. Like, it's, uh, it's a great industry that a lot of people don't give it credit for. And I like to see, like, I mean, you guys are doing amazing in Charlottetown. So much credit. To that. Very fortunate. And, the government is a great supporter here of the industry, and there's a yeah. lot of great people um, putting on a product that's uh, seen by many around the world as yeah. one of the best shows. Um, very fortunate. Very fortunate, too, to have the people all throughout the Maritimes uh, supporting the state program. I'd like to see some of the other provinces adding a little bit more money, but uh, yeah. we are pretty fortunate. Definitely. Um, I know like Charlton, it almost reminds me, I'm not just saying this or sucking up, but it kind of reminds me a bit of the seventies EPR that I heard of. You kind of see, you guys are kind of at that level now where it's, it's getting like very, very popular in Charlotte. It's always been popular, but like just, I've been really loving it. Like every time it's on, I usually watch it and I'm not even a big better. I just like to watch it because I bet I don't, I don't win anything. <laughs> I mean, I think I think I know how to read a program. Like, yeah, I'm gonna go with this, this, and that, and and this, and that, and then nothing. I'm like, why am I even doing this? I bet like ten cents super effective. It doesn't really matter. But <laughs> oh, okay. and I'd be remiss not to make mention of Lee Taylor, who would have been another influence on Dad. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and the Taylor certainly have a long history um, with horses. Um, I'm named after Lee. Um, oh, spelled know. differently. I don't think Dad yeah. knew that until. Two or three weeks after I was born, but mom liked the spelling different. It works for me. Um, and just the, there's another person that was, you know, good to us growing up. And I, and I learned lots. Like Lee would get me to go, um, you know, help when he had horses, uh, a couple of nice horses, like Radiant Star would have been one. Um, Grease was another one. Um, and some of those horses back then, um, lots of personality and quirks as well like i think yeah. not that lee really needed me uh to do anything it was, it was awful nice for him to bring me along but i think my main role um was to ride in the back with grease because she was back there by herself she just kicked the entire way to town and back and uh yeah, but if someone was there she was just happy to have somebody with her and so you would go in the back with her the whole time eh? On the yeah um yeah. Yeah, I, I assume the statute of limitations has run out on the <laughs> illegality of that because even <laughs> on the way home one night, Lee's there. I'm sure she, she'll be fine. And yeah. we got, uh, 
I don't know. It might have been we call it the Queen's Arms SO intersection, and she near hit yeah. the truck upside down. So while we're at the red light, I had to get out and get in the back. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've I've gone to St. John speaking of EPR uh, in yeah. the back of a truck as well. I was not, I'm not the only person who have ever done that. <laughs> yeah. So once she's seen you, was she just totally fine, totally yep. calm? Once, yeah. Yeah. If a horse could smile, she'd smile. She just, yeah, she just didn't want to be back there by herself. And if there was another horse, she was fine. But if it was a night where she was the only one that Lee had yeah. in, yeah. Um, she just put up a ruckus. And that was the only time. Other than that, she was gentle as a kitten and well behaved to be around, but she would kick yeah. and smash the whole time. So the other crazy horse, but I keep forgetting the name of it, Bellas or whatever it is. Basilius. Would that thing would just like you just hope not the thing doesn't kill you when you take it out of the truck, basically? Is that the way you look oh, at it? Well, yeah. And we were younger, even younger when that horse was around. So yeah, not anybody would touch those horses. Like it was common knowledge. That'd be, you know, Dad or Wally or Toby or somebody would would handle those ones for sure. That was yeah, definitely. Perfect. Okay. Well, that's great. We're kind of at a well, we're not at us. We could go on for hours, but I will let you guys. If you want to add anything else before we go, feel free. Um, not, not for me. And uh, I, I would add again, thank you very much for taking the time to do this. And uh, if there's anything, you know, uh, my feelings are not hurt if anything I said ends up in the cutting room floor. Oh, so don't, don't even worry about, about it. All. It's, it's all good. We're just gonna we're gonna. We're gonna take. We're gonna edit the part where basically we just stop it. No, and I really, guys, I want to let you know I appreciate it so much. I really, really do. Um, Barbara, I really appreciate you coming on because everyone's gonna be very happy to see you. And Bev and Lee and Kim, I know we kind of lost it halfway through there, but um, thanks, Scott. Thanks to you for uh, for what you do and how you promote uh, harness racing. Well, thank you. I appreciate the comment. Yeah, I, I love it. It's it's in my blood, and you know, I kind of but. It's, uh, I definitely, I love doing this. You guys love the history of it. I really appreciate it. Like every time I go to do a podcast and I, I send a message or I make a phone call and you, everyone like, hey, this goes for everybody. You guys are so generous with your time. Like everyone's like, yeah, sure. I'll do it. And it's yeah. like, really? Like, <laughs> like, are you serious? <laughs> like, so I really appreciate it. And I appreciate you guys coming on. Um, what I'll do again, uh, guys, I'll, I'll fix that audio up, bring it up. I'll send it. I'll send you a copy, Bev and Lee. And I know I think Kim says she's on Facebook, but you guys have shared amongst each other. Sure. And the pictures, like videos, anything like that, if you want anything, feel free to message me and I can go ahead and uh, set that up for you. Okay. That'd be great. So I really appreciate this coming on. And yeah, if anything else, again, I know I keep saying if you want to add anything else, like, but if you do, <laughs> feel free. If not, I'll let you guys go about your day. No, that's everything, I guess. Wonderful. All right, guys. Yeah, well, thank great. you very much for. Okay. Oh, Thanks, Scott. Bye. Thank you. Th yeah, thank you very much for joining it. me. Thank you. No. So, Bye now. Take care. Bye bye. Yeah. So that is the conclusion of the EPR history of EPR podcast about Francis McIsaac. I thank again um, Bev and Barbara and Lee and Kim for coming on with me today. We had a few technical difficulties in the middle of there, but that's okay. It tends to happen, so you won't even notice it when you watch. It wasn't edited out. And again, thank you for watching. Don't forget, people, subscribe to the page, like, comments. And we will see you again in the next episode of the History of EPR podcast. Here they come.